Welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave. Today, I am speaking with Jules Evans, renowned author and director of the Challenging Psychedelic Experiences Project. The field of psychedelics should not be freaked out by the fact that some people have challenging experiences and adverse experiences. There can be a temptation to like try to downplay it, minimize it, or silence it. That's not, I think, the right way to think about it. From my point of view, the right way to think about it is psychedelics can change your life and have a massive positive impact. It seems to be the case that for maybe one in 10, it can also lead to difficulties. The best way to support the long-term viability of psychedelics, to my mind, is to learn about these difficulties and find out what helps people who have them. Hey, listeners, I am so excited to have Jules Evans on the podcast today. Jules is the director of the Challenging Psychedelic Experiences Project, the author of three books, Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations, The Art of Losing Control, and Holiday from the Self, and the co-editor of Breaking Open, Finding a Way Through Spiritual Emergency. He is an honorary research fellow at the Center for the History of Emotions at Queen Mary University of London. And as of late, Jules has been publishing a lot of great uh, long-form pieces on his Substack, exploring some of the emerging trends in the psychedelic space, specifically around the shadow side of psychedelics. Uh, Some topics that he's covered has been the potential for ketamine addiction, how there are a lot more people than we realize who have gone through and navigated difficult psychedelic experience. He recently published a post on the ethics of testimonies after psychedelic retreats. Uh, Jules is always very balanced, always very thoughtful, and we had a really uh, engaging conversation for the podcast today. He's someone that I've wanted to interview for many years, and it was really great to finally have him on the show uh, to talk about this shadow side of psychedelics and how we need to bring awareness to challenging psychedelic experiences. Okay, without further ado, here's my conversation with Jules Evans. We're here with Jules Evans. Jules, whenever your name comes up in my head, I want to call you Jules Verne, um, just because uh, you know <laughs> that's the other Jules you know. It's the other Jules that I know of, yeah. But uh, and and in some ways, what you're writing now in the 21st century, there's there there could be some parallels between between what Jules Verne wrote <laughs> and what you're now writing. I mean, he was a little more science I fiction, mean, but I think, I think I come out best from that comparison. I'm not sure Jules Verne would be very happy with that. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> who would I mean? I'm, yeah, so I mean, yeah. As a starter, like, who have been some of your more influential authors that that you have read and that you love and that you have gone really deep into? Aha! Uh-huh. Well, I did English literature uh, at university, and back then, I was very into people like D. H. Lawrence uh, and T. S. Eliot. So I was very into the modernists and Aldous Huxley. So um, of, of, of them, Aldous Huxley has been the most enduring influence on me. And that's particularly on my thinking about like um, ecstatic experiences and their place in Western culture and their possible future in Western culture. Um, you know, in the kind of brief potted history of my life, as I was, I was into psychedelics when I was a teenager, by the, by the age of 18, I'd already <laughs> done too many drugs and, uh, and harmed myself. And, um, you know, developed actually PTSD after a couple of bad trips. Like HPPD or? No, uh, no. PTSD, like okay. uh, trauma. I was, I, and this happens sometimes. I had a couple of, uh, well, one particularly scary trip and didn't process it, didn't integrate it, developed the symptoms of post-traumatic stress and social anxiety, lasting for a few years. And what helped me out of that was stoicism. So um, I, I love Marcus Aurelius's meditations. I love Epictetus's discourses. And my first book was on how people use ancient Greek philosophies today, uh, particularly Stoicism. So that came out uh, 11 years ago. And I was part of that revival of Stoicism uh, and organized the first Stoic gathering oh. for like two millennia in 2010. It was, it was only 10 of us. In San Diego, but um, I'm in San Diego. Aha, organized... uh-huh. okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful place. Yeah, and I, I have this, it. you know, philosophy and surfing. Um, yeah. So, 
anyway, and so new age. there's some so new age it. enlightenment, you know, you got, you got your crystal stores and like, you do, you yeah. got your, uh, Institute of Noetic Science. Is mm-hmm. that in San Diego? I believe so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Dean Radin, Radin, who's, who talks about magic. Uh-huh. And it's interesting that the, the, the stoicism is coming up this early. Huxley does have a slightly stoic approach. Um, and the art of losing control, which is the second book that you wrote is much more Dionysian. And the the sort yes. of what I think of yeah. you as is more of this writer around ecstatic states, which feels antithetical right, right. to all of the stoic, you know, meditative. That's stuff. right. That's right. I mean, so that 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 book did best because stoicism is the easiest sell, and because you could, you know, you're writing a book with practical tips, right, that you can use immediately. So, so that book, you know, came out in 25 countries and. In a way, like maybe I should have just stuck to the stoicism as a marketing strategy that, you know, like Ryan Holiday, I could have been, you know, laughing all the way to the bank. But um, but, um, yeah, exactly. I I was aware at the end of that book that this was not the whole story um, in terms of how people heal and how they flourish. Stoicism is very rational. It's quite individualistic. It's very much about self-control and self-knowledge. But there is, as you say, this Dionysian side to life that sometimes people find healing and flourishing, not through self-control, but through surrender, not through rationality, but through the non-rational, through the ecstatic. Um, Another of my favorite books um, is a book by Nietzsche called The Birth of Tragedy. And he talks about these two forces in culture, the Apollinean, which is all rational and self-control, and the Dionysian. And I ended the, my first book, Philosophy for Life, saying there is this whole other tradition, the Dionysian. And that's what I explored in uh, The Art of Losing Control. I mean, and I researched it for five years, went and explored all kinds of different ecstatic experiences, converted to Christianity in the midst of it because I had an ecstatic experience in a church. And it was like, yeah, I mean, you know, so I was, I, you know, and then lost, lost, first of all, lost loads of newsletter subscribers because they were all these atheist stoics and i suddenly came out and was like praise jesus so that was a, another odd career pentecostal move. and the then pentecostal was, jewels the pentecostal jewels yeah ones, I, was, right? I mean i was i was in i was in a neo-pentecostal church i mean it was church of england but yeah. i was all about the trance states and then lost my faith after 18 months because it, i couldn't balance it with the, with the rational side of me gotcha. but um yeah, so so was 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 very much exploring the kind of the ecstatic, the spiritual, and the different ways that people find it in Western culture today. Um, and the the message of that second book, The Art of Losing Control, was we need to find a place for the ecstatic. We can't just marginalize it. We can't pathologize it. This is a, a part of of human experience, a part of human consciousness, and it it can be harmful. But it can also be very healing. So I was, I was again, you know, the the book on this topic is um, the Varieties of Religious Experience by William James, uh, who who basically takes you know the, this position: we can't know exactly what these experiences mean or what they point to, but we can look at how whether they ha- help or harm people. And as James argued, you know, better than anyone before or since often these experiences lead to greater flourishing. Um, so, so yeah. Well, and that was a couple of kind of things that I want to touch back on. That hypothesis or assumption by James, we could say was thus proven by Roland Griffiths and John Hopkins when looking at this, you know, relationship between psilocybin, mystical type experiences, and then their sort of long-term benefit on, specifically depression, alcoholism, I think were the two core studies that came out of Johns Hopkins. So that's like kind of one note. The other note that I want to um, emphasize for listeners is, you know, in talking about stoicism, one reflection, I, 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 I love history and I, I've been going through Will Durant. He wrote this 11, you know, series on the story of civilization. So I've been making my way through the first three so mm. far about yeah. Oriental heritage, Greece and Rome. And he makes the point in the ancient Greece book that Stoicism actually has a lot of parallels with Calvinism. And so the reason Stoicism has been maybe so easy for Ryan Holiday, for example, and for you, and for you to amplify is because it's, there's really, I mean, there are some differences because it's much more 
uh, agnostic. Uh, but a lot of the same rationality, a lot of the same self-control, a lot of the same sort of like keeping it tight is present. So mm-hmm. it's just a, it's like an easy way for ex Christians to go and stay within their same relatively similar belief structure. And I think what you did with the static states is it's like, I love the polarity that you set up with the Dionysian versus the Apollyon because that Dionysian we would argue is, is so necessary for the healing of culture, community, almost as a balancing, yeah. right? Tao is in the middle way. We've yeah. been so Apollo, Apollinian, we've been so rational, we've been so linear, we need yeah. to experience these states of mystery to bring us back to balance as a, as a, as a human society. Yeah, that's right. And and actually, William James is a great example. He was very into Stoicism. Uh, it helped him a lot. But he came to see the limits of it, the limits of self-help. And um, and in a way, he, he, you know, he was all about these moments of surrender to something bigger. When you basically say, I, I've reached the, the limit of self-help. I can't do this myself. I need like a, 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 a something, a higher power. And in that moment of surrender to something or other, that can be hugely healing. And it, it was his idea, which was one of the inspirations for Alcoholics Anonymous, which is all about surrender to something greater than you and how that can be healing, whether it, that's a placebo response or there is genuinely some higher power. Um, we don't know, but practically it, it works. Of Huxley's books, I mean, I'm a huge Huxley fan as well. So I've read The Divine yeah. Within, I've read The Perennial Philosophy, I bought a first edition of uh, I think it's Point Counterpoint, uh, one of the first novels that he published, you know, Brave New World, yeah. Island, Heaven and Hell. What are your, what are the top three kind of books or things that you've read that have really been, because the Vedantic Huxley is a more Apollininian Huxley compared to the sort of psychedelic Huxley, right? Once he starts to do mescaline. Yeah. No, there's a great talk by Alan Watts on his friend, Aldous Huxley, which you can find on YouTube, um, where he talks about him, Aldous Huxley's journey from this rather dry, ascetic, anti-body, anti-sex, anti-the-world Vedanta follower to more of a kind of tantric, like both this world and the other world, both this body and whatever's not the body. Um, As partly as his second marriage as well to Laura um, Archera was... uh, by all accounts, a very romantic, sexually active, you know, the old, old, oldest really had a kind of sexual renaissance and he got way more into his body when he was, you know, before his, his first wife, Maria said, you know, when he was younger, he was so out of his body. Uh, he was so in his head. He was so kind of shut off. And as he got older, and this might've been the second marriage, this might've been the psychedelics he was taking. He became much more open in relationships, much more connected to his body. Laura Arch- Laura Huxley, uh, his second uh, wife, tells the story of, you know, they were in a trip session in Los Angeles and someone started freaking out. And Aldous went and just, you know, quietly um, took this person's foot and started kind of, you know, massaging her and calming her down. And the idea of the kind of Aldous from the 1940s doing that is, you know, no way. He was, so, he was a frigid... Uh, icy intellectual. So he really mellowed and, and warmed. Um, but yeah, in terms of the books I love, I've got to tell you, I'm not a fan of his novels. Mm. I don't think he's a great novelist. Mm. And and I know his, he, he was great friends with Christopher Isherwood, uh, who also moved from the UK to Los Angeles and also joined the Vedanta Society of Southern California. Isherwood is this novelist who wrote um, the book that Cabaret was based on. Uh, and okay. issue it, and he also wrote a fantastic little book called The Single Man, which bizarrely I read at the Temple of the Way of Light. It was the only non-hippie book in their bookshelf at <laughs> this ayahuasca center in the Amazon. This is a great book. Uh, so Christopher Isherwood is really worth reading. But he also said he loved Aldous, but he didn't think Aldous was a natural novelist. Hmm. He's an ideas person. Mm-hmm. And in, his novels are really like, you have these walking ideas, you know, ideas with legs. That's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> but but so for me, I love his nonfiction. I love, um, I actually do like the perennial philosophy. 
I've got a, like a first edition of that, and that that has meant a lot to me as as a book over the years. I love his, you know, his writings on psychedelics and ecstatic experiences. For me, his great gift is that he is able. You know, I wrote this book about ecstatic experiences, and Aldous Huxley, more than anyone else, is able to think about ecstatic experiences on multiple levels: mm. um, political, historical theological, um, psychological, and, you know, no, no one else has the capacity to think about ecstatic experiences at all those multiple levels. Um, so, and, and his, in his talks and lectures, um, in the last kind of 10 years of his life, he was doing lectures on human potentialities, for example, which inspired Esalen. So the guys who founded Esalen were in the audience and they wrote to him and he came and visited and they, and they set up Esalen in the center of which is Huxley Hall named after him. So he really launched the human potential movement. Um, and then there's another great book of his letters with Humphrey Osmond, huge book about four fifths of which is Humphrey Osmond writing to Aldous. And he obviously idolized Aldous. And then you get these short replies back from Aldous, but but what a what a this friendship between this this psychiatrist and this great writer, and they're really they cut they coin the word psychedelic together, and they're thinking about the future of psychedelics, how this could be you know is it is this medical or is this religious, and that that book is 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 wonderfully rich to read. So you mentioned Alan Watts. I'm going to check that out. I have not read that yet. That's probably one of the few Huxley things that I haven't gotten into. So I'll, I'll purchase that. Yeah. Out. Yeah. It only came out a couple of years ago. It's called psychedelic profits. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Psychedelic profits. Uh, not like compass pathways profits, but like, uh, yeah, no, compass, they were, they were terrible. Him and Alan Watts were terrible at profit spelt yeah. the compass way. I mean, right. can you imagine all this Huxley and Alan Watts kept on trying to get funding for a research project. They couldn't get a dollar. Alan Watts and Aldous Huxley trying to get funding for a for a psychedelic project. They couldn't they couldn't wow. get a dollar. Can you imagine how much they'd raised today? Uh, billions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a really fun anecdote about when uh, Alan Watts and Aldous Huxley met, uh, and Timothy Leary was there as well. I think it was at Harvard. Uh-huh. Aldous was giving some visiting. It was either Aldous or Alan was giving a visiting lecture, and Aldous yeah. Aldous Huxley had this quote that Alan Watts was like one part priest, one part racetrack manager or something like that. Like you had yeah. this energy that would come in that he would whip around. And of course the, you know, Aldous was, I think this was just before he, he ended up uh, transitioning and passing on in the, in the early sixties yeah. was maybe a year or two before his death. And what he really emphasized was what I would call a more elitist approach to psychedelics. Uh, whereas <sighs> Timothy Leary and Alan Watts was a little bit involved. I mean, he talked about psychedelics, but he wasn't necessarily as intimately sort of intricately intertwined with them like Huxley and Leary. And Leary was much more of the, yeah. you know, sort of egalitarian, you know, everyone should do this. Uh-huh. And Huxley thought that was a, a, a mistake, a huge mistake. Yeah. Um, and I'm yeah. curious just to hear you sort of riff on that now that we're in 2023, now that psychedelics are becoming more accessible, now that there's a lot of talk and conversation about accessibility and everyone should have access to these. What are your thoughts on, you know, psychedelics, mainstreaming them? Should this be kept to people who are quote unquote Mm -hmm. ready and prepared? Or do you think Mm -hmm. everyone and anyone can benefit from, from these substances? Right. So you're absolutely right. There was this conversation in the early 60s about were psychedelics, should psychedelics be for everybody? And Aldous's plan initially was to introduce it to the elite. Uh, They wanted to do a research program and they would give it to Einstein and the philosopher A.J. Eyre and, you know, maybe his friend Stravinsky and, you know, um, and, 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 you know, just to the elite and, 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 and particularly creative people, uh, it's an aspect of the research then that's completely lost now. It was, it was um, psychedelics for, for, for art, for aesthetics. Um, but, uh, and, and, and he, you know, they, he and Osmond passed the torch to Timothy Leary. Initially, they were worried he was too square. 
um, they, 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 he was, you know, and then and then after about a year, they're like, there's a letter where Aldous writes to Humphrey Osman says, "What happened to Timothy Leary?" And they're like, you know, um, and there's some. I mean, if you go on YouTube, you can hear a video I posted of, of him tripping. You know, because there are there are trip tapes of Aldous and Laura, and 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 in it, he's kind of saying, well. What he's discussing Timothy Leary while he's on acid and saying, well, it's he's blaming Leary's Irishness that there was this rebellious streak in Leary that always wanted to, you know, shock. Anyway, you know, it has to be said as well, but don't forget Aldous's book, Doors of Perception, in in the words of Alan Watts, let the cat out of the bag. So that was the Michael Pollan book of the 50s and 60s. You know, suddenly this this incredibly famous writer says, here are these substances which give you mystical experiences. So, you know, if he really wanted to keep it just among the elite, he should have never written that book. But he could not resist uh, a great story. And I think he also saw it as maybe his, you know, his gift to the world. Uh, he was going to change the world, start a new religion. And the Huxleys always had this prophetic aspect to them. His brother, Julian Huxley, also wanted to start his own religion as well. So they, they had a gene for, for religious kind of prophecy. All right, look, um, to get to your question, you know, should these be for everyone? Um, I, I, I think it's a question of how we reintegrate these, these substances into Western culture. And I think we're going from a state where, to some extent, ecstatic experiences were marginalized and pathologized in Western culture for about uh, 300 and 400 years. Since around the Enlightenment, Paul, like Western cultures have said, uh, ecstatic experiences are delusional. They're dangerous. You know, you're going you're gonna to go crazy. Stay in control. Stay rational. So there was this narrowing of our bandwidth of consciousness. And this comes back to Calvinism. Because there's a yeah. overlap there with Martin Luther and you know the the split from Catholicism and uh -huh. you know yeah all I mean there was still yeah yeah I, I, that's right and I think you're right that it goes back to the Reformation as well before that the Catholic Church had a monopoly on ecstatic experiences the Reformation blows that up suddenly you have groups wandering around Europe with people saying I'm Jesus we're holy we can't sin like crazy ecstatic cults some of which were violent. And so ecstasy starts to get a bad reputation. By ecstasy, I mean like ecstatic experiences. That even more so during the Enlightenment. Um, a lot of Enlightenment philosophers like Adam Smith, Thomas Hobbes say religious ecstasy is, is nuts, is delusional and dangerous. Stay in control, stay rational. Um, this, you know, there, of course, there are countercurrents like romanticism, like ecstatic Christianity, but on the whole, these were marginal. Now, what's happening since the 60s and even more um, today is an explosion of ecstatic experiences back into Western culture through psychedelics, through contemplative practices, um, and so on, but particularly through psychedelics. Um, on the whole, that's good. I think because these are normal human experiences, we are be becoming reacquainted with aspects of our, of our of our consciousness. But it's messy. It's sudden and it's messy. And it's taking place within a hyper-capitalist system. So um, do, I, do I think that, you know, ecstatic, you know, ecstatic experiences are for, uh, for everyone? Uh, yes, I think these are a normal part of human experience. They're not essential. Some people are more prone to ecstatic experiences than others. So it's not like if you've never had an ecstatic experience, you haven't really lived. But they're normal. They're normal and human. Um, and psychedelics are one way you can reach ecstatic experiences. However, we are, we are very ecstatically naive in Western culture. We are infants. We have no cultural infrastructure in place for these experiences. Um, we got rid of our monasteries 500 years ago. Um, we got rid of our maps and guides for ecstatic experiences 500 years ago. Um, so we don't have the cultural infrastructure in place. We don't have the cultural literacy in place. So there's lots of work that's going to need to be done. And it's going to need to be done 
in this messy way as millions of people are having these experiences. And basically, uh, some of them are going to be having mystical experiences that are, they are not prepared for. They're going to go and try psychedelics because um, they want some fun or they want a bit of, uh, you know, they want healing or they want to relax or just want to explore. And suddenly, a bit like the same kind of dynamic is happening in meditation, they get a mystical experience that they were not expecting, that they did not sign up for, and suddenly they're in a different, an altered self and an altered universe. Um, okay, for lots of those people, all that means is they're going to feel a bit wobbly for two weeks and then they'll go back to who they were before. But for some people, it's the beginning of a journey that they were not expecting and were not prepared for. Um, so that's, that's my, my answer is I think we need to upgrade our cultural resources for all these people for this re-emergence of the ecstatic into Western culture. So when this topic comes off to, up often, I, I think of lineage and I think of generations. And I had a wonderful podcast interview with Paul Stamets a few months back. And he made the point that it takes about seven generations for um for like healing for learning for reacquaintance and when it comes to the indigenous use of entheogens of plant medicines you know they've only been disconnected from these medicines for maybe a few generations three four five six seven generations right and and obviously mm -hmm. colonialism genocide all that was awful and terrible yeah. and we have to be mindful of cultural appropriation, reciprocity, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what I often point to is like, as from a Western perspective, our lineage with these, with these psychedelics have been caught off for, I would, I would say more than 500 years, I would say 1700 years since the advent of Christianity when the Eleusinian mysteries were eliminated. And so that was like, we were, we were, we had a, in, in ancient Greece, there was a rich sort of familiarity whether it was the Eleusinian mysteries, whether it was the Orphic mysteries, you know, where this was sort of part and parcel of uh, their their culture, and so all of a sudden the 1960s come around, and I don't think it's any coincidence that LSD is made from ergot, just like the Kaikion was made from ergot, and and all of a sudden it's like, what the fuck is this? You know, what is happening? And so as I've as I've reflected on this, you know, when when we started Third Wave many many years ago in 2015, the reason I led with microdosing and even continue to lead with microdosing in so many ways is because the sort of educational context that actually taking less is probably better for most people as a way to sort mm -hmm. of onboard people into the deep end of their consciousness. Because sort of my reflection on talking about Leary in the 60s is this whole uh, turn on, tune in, drop out, everyone do 500 micrograms of acid, right? Mm -hmm. Like we just didn't have the, the appropriate cultural context to actually hold all of the energy that that contained yeah yeah and they were trying to figure it out in the 60s and aldous huxley gave leary a copy of the tibetan book of the dead on one of his visits to harvard and they were like oh this is it wow i mean they'd never read it before and they were like this is this is what we're you know him and alpert were like this is what our trips have been like so they then created that trip guide um what was it called? The Psychedelic Experience Guide? Based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is kind of funny. Yeah, all the bardos. But, yeah, all the bardos. But so so they were trying to figure it out then. And it's, I mean, it's really, I'm both kind of fascinated and excited and worried by the kind of the, the speed with, it, with which everything's happening. Um, and I think, you know, that it's 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 more full on now than it was in the 60s. Um just, just because so. I guess the 60s, I do, I think it's laid the groundwork. Yeah, okay, I'll tell you two reasons why. In the 60s, there was like a handful of, of little psychedelic movements and, and organizations. Um, as far as I know now, there's like well over 200 psychedelic churches just in the US. Um, yeah, I, I, wow. this, I did not know this either. I, I interviewed um, Alison Hoots from the Sacred Plant Alliance. Okay. She's a lawyer who advises psychedelic churches, and she estimated there are at least 200, uh, the vast majority of which have started in the last few years. Wow. So there's this scene growing really fast, way faster than it was in the 60s. The other thing is that in the 60s, um, there wasn't perhaps as, as much of a sense of a mental health crisis 
there wasn't as much demand for therapy. Therapy was still quite new in the 60s. Mm-hmm. And now there's a huge sense of a mental health crisis, a huge therapy culture, and uh, millions of people looking to psychedelics to, for healing from their problems. That was not the case so much in the, in the 60s. Um, so you've got this booming psychedelic religion scene, and you've got this, this huge demand um, for, for psychedelic therapy. And um, it's, it's being taken up by, the, by capitalism in a way that it wasn't in the 60s. It never really got to that point. There was a few clinics that were beginning to offer psychedelic therapy in the 60s. Um, but they were like in Saskatchewan. And and, yeah, they did know. quite well. Some of them. There was yeah, but there there was one in like Los Angeles, okay. in like, Menlo Park, mm-hmm. um, and th- th- there was one in Canada where they they did so well that the guy, the psychiatrist ran, running it, bought the biggest mansion in uh, Vancouver. It might have been. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, so, but not much. Nothing like nothing like now. Not with like major venture capital, billion dollar companies. So it's, it's, um, it's bigger than it, now than it was in the 60s. And that's exciting, but it's also like, wow, how's this, how's this going to play out? And, it, and it, we're already seeing that it's, it's messy. It's exciting and it's messy. Well, and let's, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, what I often think about is tail risk. So the concept of tail risk, meaning that oftentimes what upends a system or what upends um, a community or what upends whatever, it's not a majority, but it's the 1%, so to say, right? 99% of people are probably having, um, actually, you would know these details, actually, because you've been studying this. So I I would love to hear your thoughts on like, my impression is 95% of people are having either positive or neutral experiences with psychedelics, right? And you're probably, it's something in the three to 5% of range that are either having traumatizing experiences, negative experiences, maybe they have an expectation of being healed and they're not being healed. So that's mm-hmm. a letdown. And, and, and my bet would be about like a half percent are having like very difficult, potentially traumatic, potentially like dangerous experiences. Uh, but that 0.5% you know, could be enough to create the the sort of media maelstrom, so to say, that we had in the the sixties. So you've been studying this. Right. So I'd love to just sort of open yeah. open this up. Challenging psychic yeah, sure. experiences. What are you learning as you've been doing research on this over the last while? Right. So um, I wrote a piece in twenty twenty one saying we should research more um, the you know difficult trips, extended difficulties. There's you know three billion raised, uh, and the amount spent on researching adverse experiences, challenging experiences, is like next to nothing. There are hardly any um, studies, and there isn't that much invested in um, you know, support integration for for people who have difficult experiences. Um, and I even suggested back then, what if psychedelic companies, funds, and research centers invested one percent uh, of their of their of the money they raise in harm reduction. Um, so, uh, and then the, the, you know, last year I thought, well, why don't, why don't we do this then? I mean, I have a background in, in academia. Uh, I'm, a, I, uh, for eight years worked at the center for the history of the emotions in like medical humanities. Uh, so that's kind of philosophy and you know, medical history. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm still an honorary research fellow there. So do you have a PhD? Um, I don't have a PhD. I came via journalism. So I was a journalist for 10 years. Uh, and then we went into academia, uh, you know, yeah, skipping that, skipping that part. Um, so I gathered a team together last year to and launch the uh, Challenging Psychedelic Experiences Project. Um, so this is working with psychologists and therapists and religious studies scholars uh, at like Imperial uh, University College London, Haifa University in Israel, University of Sydney. So we're a team of um, about 10 researchers. And we, uh, we, we said we want to research um, not, not bad trips, because there's already been some research on that, but um, people who have difficulties be after the trip. 
So we want to look at, um, yeah, that kind of thing. What happens after the trip? Does anyone get into difficulties lasting beyond the trip itself? Um, we raised some money uh, and we started to do research. Um, we produced, we've already produced our first paper. It was authored by me and uh, a researcher called Anna Lutkatchis, uh, who's at the University of Sydney. She did um, interviews with people after a synthesis retreat, sorry, after a, a magic mushroom retreat at synthesis. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was for her PhD. And 30% of the people she interviewed after a mushroom retreat, actually, you know, it's a truffle retreat, truffle. not a mushroom retreat. Yeah. 30% um, of them reported um, integration challenges in the weeks after their trip, which is quite a lot. All of them, uh, these were problems like uh, problems reconnecting with, you know, their life back at home or post-ecstatic blues. The trip was so amazing, everyday life is, is crummy. Um, ontological shock, you know, uh, destabilizing their sense of reality, emotional volatility. All of that resolved after two to three weeks. So we called our paper Short-Term Integration Challenges. But it highlighted the fact that retreat centers and therapists and so on should be aware that people are often, you know, one in three in a wobbly state for two to three weeks after um, an experience. Um, we then launched a survey and we asked people, have you ever had difficulties after a trip lasting longer than a day? Um, would you tell us um, what they were like, if so, uh, and what helped you to deal with them? We got over 600 responses, um, of whom, by the by, I mean, I, we're still analyzing it for, for another paper, but just, you know, in terms of, 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 of a kind of get, give you a sense of some of what we found out. Um, so two fifths, 40 percent of people, the difficulties lasted longer than a year. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, one fifth difficulties lasted longer than three years. Wow. Um, the most common kind of difficulties people reported were fear and anxiety, just often just basic anxiety but also things like uh, fear of um, fear of death being increased, uh, social disconnection, uh, feeling disconnected from the people in your life, um, derealization, which is like what is real. It, it destabilizes people's sense of reality. Depersonalization, like I feel fragmented. People, uh, fear of permanent damage, like did I mess up my brain? Um, we, and we're going to see, like, you know, which kinds of difficulties last longer. Some of these things will be, again, two to three weeks, and then they resolve. What? Um, and then we ask people what they found helpful, different types of therapy, different types of self-care, talking to people. So we're going to use this data, and we're also going to make this data open to other researchers as well, by the way, to try and work out predictive factors for who gets into extended difficulties and predictive factors for how to minimize those extended difficulties. So that what, you know, it did, we're not talking months and years, we're talking hopefully kind of weeks. Um, so in terms of the prevalence, uh, this study is not looking at the prevalence, right. uh, how often these kinds of things, but some other studies have. So two papers have looked at how often people get into extended difficulties after trips. One was a, um, a paper by an organization called ICERS, I-C-E-E-R-S. Have you come across them, Paul? They're a great um, NGO in, in, in Barcelona. We've had Ben on the podcast a few years ago. And okay. I love, yeah, yeah, I love their okay. work in terms of what they're doing on the yeah. ethnobotanic. They do advocacy botanic. and they do research. I mean, they're, they're a really impressive organization. Mm -hmm. They did a study um, based on the global ayahuasca survey uh, of um, 11,000 people who've taken part in ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh, and in that survey, 12% said they'd had psychological difficulties for which they'd sought um, assistance. Um, so, uh, and then, uh, but, you know, of course, there may have been more people who'd had difficulties who didn't seek psychological assistance. Then there was a paper that came out um, just a week ago um, by uh, a, a researcher called Otto Simonson and his team. They did a survey online. They found 10% um, of trippers uh, reported an experience leading to 
um, functional impairment lasting longer than a day. Hmm. Uh, and 6% said that they thought of harming themselves or others wow. uh, during this time. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, okay, so all of that has to be bracketed with this, which is that the, the, the field of psychedelics should not be freaked out by the fact that some people have challenging experiences and adverse experiences. There can be a temptation to like try to um, downplay it, minimize it, or silence it. Like if we talk about this stuff, then what's gonna, what happened in the 60s is going to happen again. This is the fear. It will spoil the reputation of psychedelics. It will prevent um, and their, their, their legalization um, that's not, I think, the right way to think about it. From my point of view, the right way to think about it is um, psychedelics can change your life and have a massive positive impact. Um, for millions of people, they have. It seems to be the case that for maybe, you know, one in 10, it can also lead to difficulties. That doesn't mean that they don't ultimately have a positive experience. It's just like they might have difficulties as well. The best way to support the long-term viability of psychedelics, to my mind, is to learn about these difficulties uh, and find out what, what helps people who have them, to minimize and reduce the intensity and duration of these difficulties. Every medicine has um, side effects. If you look at antidepressants, something like 50% of people who take antidepressants report side effects. Wow. Um, what, you know, so one in two, that might be things like loss of libido, um, weight gain, sleep issues, all the way up to serious problems like uh, suicidality. Um, for years, Big Pharma denied that there were any serious adverse problems with antidepressants. And it took years um, for, and law cases for, for that to be acknowledged. Nonetheless, still lots of people are helped by antidepressants. And I'm not anti-SSRIs. They really help. Some people find them life-saving. Mm -hmm. Now, psychedelics, you're talking about fewer. You're talking about a lower percentage of people who, who have um, adverse effects. So this, you know, it's, it's okay uh, to, to talk about it and to learn about it. But um, so far, there's been very little research. Well, um, and, and that is a liability. And what comes to mind is like if if you don't if you don't allow for the shadow, it'll eat you. So if we if if we're thinking right. about this from an archa archetypal perspective or Jungian perspective, it's like if that is repressed, not acknowledged, not brought to the light, not brought to the surface, then that could be the very thing. Not not the media necessarily, but that could be the very thing that actually consumes uh, the movement in a way. Right, right. And particularly if if the, there's been you know, signs in the last year or so when there've been some negative stories. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been struck by how sometimes the psychedelic field uh, or particularly the psychedelic industry has reacted very defensively um, with either kind of denial, uh, counterattack, victim blaming, uh, which is not a mature response. The mature res response is like, uh, yes, you know, there are these, you know, sometimes what, you know, one in 10 might have, short-term, medium-term difficulties. And, you know, let's learn how to prevent these being long-term difficulties. And also, you know, recognize that every medicine has side effects and, you know, not taking any medicine also has side effects, as in not treating mental illness. That also has, a, you know, really bad side effects. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that, that would be the kind of mature response. It's also about informed consent, Paul. Like, if, I, if I'm trying a, a new medicine, I would like to know, you know, what, what, what are the worst case scenarios? Um, and, and if you're not told about that at all, then there's a legal risk. So that's a good transition for ketamine and ketamine addiction. Uh -huh. You know, you've, you've written, I believe, at least one, if not a couple pieces now on Substack around ketamine, around the harms, or potential harms of ketamine, the addiction potential, 
ketamine is not a classic psychedelic. It's a disassociative, but it's being sort of introduced into a psychedelic-like context and being presented as a psychedelic, even though it's very distinct from LSD, psilocybin, the lysergamides, the tryptamines, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd love if you could just sort of share a little bit about what are you observing and noticing as it relates to the growth of interest in ketamine, particularly telemedicine ketamine, as well as maybe ketamine yeah. infusions. What are some right. of the concerns that you're picking up on, the risks, the addiction potential? Uh, I think that's an important thing to highlight as part of this conversation. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, y- you'll know more than me, Paul, uh, because you, you, you've been a- aware of the kind of ketamine market for like longer than me. I'm, I, I've written about the kind of more classic psychedelics for the last five years um, and the, the, the kind of sometimes you know, painfully slow um, move towards uh, authorization and regulation of things like psilocybin therapy. I've written about ayahuasca, LSD, and, and in a way I was kind of aware of ketamine, but it was a bit off my radar. And I think that's true for a lot of people in the kind of psychedelic field. And um, it was really, it was an article in Business Insider um, which and it was about the risk of psychedelic uh, sort of ketamine dependency. Um, so I read that and I was like and, and started to look into it and and wrote. I've only written one piece on it for, for my Substack, but I was like, wow, this has grown really fast. Mm-hmm. Um, like th- th- there was, I, I mean, one statistic was like there was about hundred ketamine clinics uh, in the US. Um, uh, about three or four years ago. I think there's now over like 600. Oh my God. Like, so it's, it's, it's really grown uh, quickly. Um, and another thing that's happened, so there's been this, you know, and that's partly on the back of the hype around psychedelics. Mm-hmm. There's been so much hype around psychedelic therapy and how it can be healing, but it's, it's not been easy to get, you know, to get mushroom therapy to, um, or to, you know, let alone to go and do ayahuasca in the Amazon or something. So while people have been waiting for these other miracle cures, there has been ketamine, which has already got FDA approval as an um, anesthetic. Um, and suddenly it's being, it's being offered for everything under the sun, um, ketamine infusions. And now the second thing that, as you know, happened is that um, ketamine telehealth completely boomed uh, during the the pandemic, uh, companies like Field Trip and Mind Bloom, um, where you could order ketamine and it gets delivered to your door, and you know you, you, you supposedly you have someone on Zoom while you're taking it, but, but you know to, to a large extent it's it's it, you, you know you're left to take it uh, yourself, and that has grown really fast. Um, so I, I guess the piece was partly saying, wow, this is this has been off my radar. But this has grown massively fast, and also, you know, alerting other, you know people in the psychedelic community. You know, have you have you seen what's happening in the ketamine market? Um, and then the kind of health risks are really, I suppose, um, twofold. That there are concerns about ketamine dependency. I, I, I don't know figures of prevalence, but that some people become dependent on ketamine, uh, and there is, you know. There's been uh, stories about this. There've been research articles about this, in particularly in the UK, uh, you know, where I'm from, and particularly like I, I used to, I used to live in Bristol in the West Country of the UK. They had a massive ketamine problem there, mm. um, and in China they had a ma- they had whole whole towns. Okay, no, that's probably not true, but they had a big problem. It's, they made a lot of the ketamine, of, you know, in the world supply, okay. uh, and they had big dependency issues. So. That's one issue. And the other issue is if you're taking ketamine um, every day, um, it leads to, it harms your body. It can lead to things like ketamine bladder where people, you know, have to pee um, constantly. Uh, it, people have had to have parts of their bladder removed. So, um, and then I suppose that the third issue is that people take ketamine and they, they have negative psychological experiences. Um, there, was a, there was a paper that looked at this um, recently. Um, people sometimes struggle to let go. They have an infusion. They have a powerful ketamine experience, and it's frightening for them because, again, we're, we're, a, we're an anti-ecstatic culture. We're not very good at surrendering control, losing control. 
So there is um, a lady whose whose name I can't remember, but maybe maybe you've met her, and maybe, if not, she might be a good interview um, person for your podcast. But she 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 runs a kind of ketamine clinic, and she she kind of does advocacy around ethical ketamine. Mm. And she said she's had about a thousand letters from people talking about adverse ketamine experiences, and we're talking about um, bad psychological experiences. Wow. So I wrote about that, um, and you know, just just the kind of the kind of hyper capitalist thing as well. Like like I wrote about it, someone contacted me who's in ketamine marketing. And they and they've kept on they they've sent me like repeated spam messages saying hi Jules listen you know can we can we touch base uh, let me help you turn you turn turn into a seven figure ketamine clinic you know how to get people in those chairs and and hooked up to those drips uh, you know we, we we've got a fantastic program and I didn't reply and then I got another message saying you know Jules really keen can we are you getting these calls Jules can we jump on a call like uh, you know we can help you to get like 40 plus customers a week, you know, this, this kind of thing. So, and it reminded me a little bit of, of like the mortgage market in, in the, in the noughties, you know, I, I used to write about structured finance at the start of my career and it was booming and there was so much um, fast money being made. And when you have a bubble market like that, there are strong incentives to um, cut corners. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's what I saw happening. I also know the other side of the story is I know people who say they've, their life has been saved by ketamine therapy. Um, and then there are libertarians who say, you know, yes, there are risks, but I'm an adult. Let me deal with these risks. So, you know, there are those sides to the story as well. Well, and o um, overall, ketamine is not a classic psychedelic. What mm. I've personally experienced with it is because it's only an hour to an hour and a half. Mm. And oftentimes the way it's prescribed is through a nasal spray that it's become sort of a drug de jour at different parties. So a lot of people who would call, consider themselves, let's say, Cali sober will not drink alcohol, but they'll do nasal sprays of ketamine instead. Um, yeah, I and I, you know, I, I, I got a, I've been prescribed a couple times. I did the mind bloom experience with the telemedicine. It's a little bit different than you, than you explained. Um, you meet with, so you have a coach, not necessarily a clinician, but a coach. And this is in mind bloom. I think it's similar for some of the other ones like new life and field trip. You meet with that coach on zoom before you take the ketamine. They confirm that you have a trip sitter there. And then you take the ketamine. It's a lozenge form at home with a trip sitter. And then you can check in with them right after the experience, but they're not necessarily, at least with the experience that I went through on Zoom with you as you're, as you're, as you're going through it. Um, it's mm -hmm. quite easy to get a prescription. The joke that I've sort of um, uh, compared ketamine to is like medical marijuana. You know, it's mm -hmm. like if you have a back issue, you can get a prescription or you could for medical marijuana. With ketamine, mm -hmm. it's similar. If at any point you've experienced depression or anxiety, you don't have to be clinically... Mm -hmm depressed or have a clinical diagnosis, you can also be prescribed ketamine. So it's definitely a little loose. Now, a lot of these things, the, the sort of looseness of it, my sense is hitting, uh, it's, it's hitting a, like, so when COVID hit in the United States, there was an act put into place that allowed for telemedicine prescriptions because people can come in to see a doctor that is now shifting. Uh, beginning in May. They haven't figured out the final rules for that now, but that will substantially change the telemedicine ketamine market in the uh -huh. United States, which will be interesting because now it will not be as easy as just hopping on Zoom with someone for five minutes. You'll actually have to go in, uh, talk with a doctor or a medical professional, and then get a a prescription. So there's... Um, and you know, I've I've never had I've never struggled with a ketamine addiction myself. I I did notice mm. that I would get into flows where I would do it once or twice a week, like a little bit of a like go in the sauna and do a nasal spray because it was so easy. You know, mm. my challenge has always been, and and maybe this is even you know a broader conversation. It's like my challenge has been cannabis. You know, I, I've mm -hmm. I've been more or less addicted to cannabis for like four years. Now and it's not all day every day, but it's certainly something that I've taken a couple months off at a time. But I keep coming back to, and so mm. this all comes to like education. It comes down to um, you know meaning and purpose. It comes down to uh, hot, 
you know, for a legal market, you know, I can literally walk five minutes from where I am right now and go into a dispensary and buy weed. Um, I think right. this is, so it's a big question of like, how accessible do we want these to be? And, uh, and what are some of the risks when anyone and everyone can take them? And I, I sense with ketamine, the yeah. risks are more substantial than my personal take than like psilocybin because psilocybin is more anti-addictive. More people are just microdosing. There aren't the same, you don't have a physiological sort of addictive nature to microdosing. It's kind of a, it's, it's just a different cat so to say yeah and it's not a uh, it's not a kind of dissociative right it, it can't be used to numb emotions right. like booze can and as far as i understand like like ketamine can sometimes and like cannabis can right and so it's sort of right. cannabis ketamine booze porn netflix these all fit into this yeah. sort of like desire to numb, numb. yeah uh, and yeah. psilocybin Obviously, ayahuasca, uh, even MDMA, it's not, it's not that. Necessary. No, it can lead to arguably different forms of dependency. Like you get hooked on a certain kind of spiritual high, and but I think that's, yeah, I mean, it can happen, but it's I, maybe it's rarer. Yeah, sort of the psychological dependency of feeling like the only way you can be centered or the only way that you can deal with yourself is if you're doing an ayahuasca journey every month, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all you talk about that kind of thing, but I mean, yeah. So it, I think it was just the, the pace of growth uh, that, that startled me. Um, and, and, and I think also the kind of ag aggressive capitalist models. I'm, I'm, I'm not at all anti-capitalist, but uh, you know, like, Capitalism also has side effects. It, it can lead to incentives of just make as much money as possible. And, you know, this is for everyone. We want to roll this out to everyone. And I think, yeah, it must be extremely exciting to be running a ketamine company at the moment because this, the speed of growth is insane. Um, and so, and, and ketamine companies are buying up other ketamine companies. There is a race to get as many clinics as possible um, as many customers as possible. And that should, I think that should, that should ring alarm bells um, when this is a, when this is a, a, a substance that causes, can cause dependency. Um, and, you know, especially like this is only a few years after, well, we're still in the midst of the, you know, fallout from Oxycontin. Right. Um, so it, 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 it has similarities, you know, like, uh, uh, a quite powerful drug suddenly being reframed as the solution to pain and suffering, uh, aggressive marketing, aggressive search for customers. Um, so that, but yeah, I mean, that's. Well, and and the, so the way I'd love to wrap up the conversation today is, is, you know, you have, you've done a lot of writing, you've done a lot of research, you've been very involved in the psychedelic space and these sort of, ecstatic states for a long time um well a long mm. time comparatively right um, <laughs> eight nine ten right. years uh, we talked about stoicism you know sort of versus a more dionysian uh aspect uh we we covered the the the, the, the challenging experiences some of the shadows some of the risk and so i'd love to just hear you talk a little bit at length about like what are those guardrails that we should be putting in place to ensure that we can integrate ecstatic states successfully? What, what should we be paying attention to? What should we be mindful of? Um, you know, I, I remember uh, a similar book that came out to yours was Stealing Fire around the same time. And so at the end of Stealing Fire, you know, right. their, their, their mythic metaphor that they talk about is Prometheus. And when Prometheus stole fire from the gods, it never ends up working out. And I think what we're going through right, right now is psychedelics have never been this sort of mainstream available treatment or everyone's been using it. Even in ancient Greeks, it was the mysteries. It was secret. It was to the side. You know, it wasn't this like globalized technocratic capitalist society that was latching on to a miracle cure. Um, so right. yeah, I'd love to hear you sort of pontificate on that. Like how do we ensure that this doesn't go right. sideways? What guardrails need to be in place? Um, how would you sort of land this conversation? I suppose. Right. Yeah. Well, I, 
I think I am sympathetic to uh, Jamie Wheel's point of view. I think it's mine as well, which is that I, I wonder if we can learn ecstatic literacy uh, without necessarily creating some kind of new ecstatic religion. Uh, you know, like a kind of well-informed, relatively evidence-based um, spirituality, open source spirituality of ecstatic experiences, um, rather than some kind of new, massive, global, psycho you know, ecstatic cult, or a refashioned old ecstatic cult like uh, Christianity or Islam. Um, so that's, you know, that's my kind of idea. And, and so that would mean particularly um, ecstatic education. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a piece, um, which I'll, I'll give you the link for, about how to improve ecstatic literacy in our culture. It was like 10, 10 lessons for ecstatic literacy. And it's, you know, we've got to learn, relearn these basic points. They were things like, um, just because you have an ecstatic experience in the presence of someone else, doesn't mean that they're holy or blessed by God, which is one mistake that people make, and that's what leads to kind of cults. Um, likewise, just because you have an ecstatic experience doesn't mean you're holy or necessarily blessed by God. Um, just because you believe something during an ecstatic experience doesn't mean it's definitely true. Um, ecstatic experiences aren't always uh, healing. So there are these kinds of basic rules that we need to uh, relearn and, and share and spread to, to improve ecstatic literacy uh, in our culture. So that's, that's, that's the vision I have for it. As now, I, I'm no longer a Christian. I'm, an, you know, I'm not a, even a Stoic either, even though I've got a Stoic tattoo on my arm that I got you know, when I was in San Diego, which is never coming off. But I'm not, I don't consider myself a, a Stoic anymore. I'm an agnostic. Like the position I've arrived at in terms of making sense of these experiences is like, I don't know. I've had powerful ecstatic experiences, you know, both psychedelic and I had a near death experience when I was like 24, um, life changing experiences. And I, and I tried to work out exactly what they meant and what they tell me about reality and about the universe I'm in. And I reached the limit of my understanding. Um, I don't know. So I consider myself an, ag an agnostic. Um, I don't think, you know, you can arrive at firm conclusions about the nature of reality from these experiences. They're too mysterious. There are, there are hints, suggestions. But in the words of like St. Paul, in this life, we see through a glass darkly. We just have guesses about the bigger picture. And these kinds of experiences give us glimpses, but... The, I think the, one of the big risks of, a, of a, an, a more ecstatic Western culture is it, it leads to an increase in dogmatism and fundamentalism and people being totally sure that they're right, that their particular politics is right, that their particular conspiracy theory is right, that their particular religion is right. Why are they so sure? Because they had this ecstatic experience and it told them. Um, this is what happened in the Reformation. All these kinds of crazy cults appeared. People running around Germany saying, I am God. Uh, you know, give me all your possessions. Let's execute the heretics. So that's the risk is that it, we're in a crazy time and the, 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 the kind of return of ecstatic experiences just makes it crazier. So um, how to improve ecstatic literacy so that we can be open to this aspect of human experience without becoming, without it actually narrowing our reality, not opening our minds, but narrowing it and leading to dogmatism. Um, but, you know, Paul, like when you're talking about the ecstatic, it's everything is unpredictable. Who would have guessed that, um, you know, a, 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 a a minor Jewish prophet, uh, you know, from a, from an illiterate family, uh, who who were taught for about three, you know, three years and then was killed, that that his teachings 
would still be followed by 2 billion people today. So, you know, who would have thought that some random ecstatic meeting in Los Angeles in 1905 would create Pentecostalism, um, which is the fastest growing religious movement today. And like, you know, I think, you know, hundreds of people convert to Pentecostalism every day. Wow. Maybe even thousands. Wow. Um, so in other words, I can, uh, it's very interesting for us to discuss the future of ecstatic experiences in Western culture, but it's, it's totally unpredictable. Like, for all we know, some new kind of Gaia cult, um, the Church of St. Greta might suddenly appear and, and sweep through the West. All of these things are going to also react with external events, like what happens with climate change, what happens with capitalism, what happens with democracy. Um, so it's, it's just unpredictable. I am all, what I'm doing is like putting out an attempt to improve ecstatic literacy and to help all these millions of people having ecstatic experiences, if, if, if they're difficult, to help them, you know, maybe try to make sense of them in a non-dogmatic, non-fundamentalist way. But I'm doing that knowing that there are these massive historical forces which are far more powerful than any work we're doing. Um, but also with a kind of you know, general optimism, general hope. Uh, you know, I'm an agnostic. I don't know if there's a God, but I have a hope that things generally get better and that there is a God kind of, you know, if manifesting or appearing or evolving. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's my, that's, that's, that's my position. So I have this sense of, Yeah. And I, and I love the idea of like the principles of a static literacy. You know, I've talked about a similar thing with psychedelic literacy and what are the principles right. of psychedelic literacy. And, and even the way I framed it is looking at working with psychedelics as a skill. And so, you know, if we're working with a static state, states, how do we develop the skill of ecstasy? So it doesn't necessarily consume right. us, our family, our community, whatever it is, but it's something that can be contained in a way and actually leveraged exactly. and utilized for good. Exactly, exactly right. And I'm sure you've met in your, all your travels and interviews um, uh, people who are quite dogmatic, that their path is the right path, mm -hmm. their drug is the right drug, their interpretation of psychedelics experiences is the right one and everyone else is less evolved or, or heretical or demonic. Um, so it's about this kind of um, epistemic flexibility uh, and humility and, and, in a way, epistemic humility exactly, as well. Exactly, exactly right. Yeah. yeah, like this is what I think, but kind of who knows. That's a good position to hold. Jules Evans, thank you for joining us for the podcast. This has been, I think it, it, it lived up to our expectations. We've been talking about doing this for maybe a year, year and a half now. And uh, it's the first time we've met face to face, yeah. although we've, we've dropped messages here and there on Twitter or LinkedIn. But um, this was a, Phenomenal conversation. So thank you for I really enjoyed it too. I, I didn't look at the clock once. Yeah. Good. There we go. I love it. Okay. So you have a sub stack. If people want to learn more about your writing and go deeper into this, what, what can you yeah, tell them about Yeah. If they the want to find out about this research project, it's challengingpsychedelicexperiences.com. Uh, at that website, they can find a link to the newsletter, um, which the sub stack is called Ecstatic Integration. Um, and yeah, I also write on, on, you know, medium, but I think the best, the best kind of place just for our conversation is, is challenging psychedelic experiences.com. And we will, uh, link out to all of those in the show notes. So if you're listening to this and you're on the road, just head to the website, find the Jules Evans episode. And a lot of the stuff that we mentioned today in the episode will be, will be linked to. Thank you, Jules, for coming on. Thank you for the work that you are doing. Thank you for, you know, all the digging and diving and the journalism and the amplification of static states and the risks of all of this. I think you're, you know, you're doing really good work and it, it it's, it's making an impactful difference uh, in the overall psychedelic landscape. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, it, it was a real pleasure to, to meet you properly. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit the thethirdwave.co where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.